This is Epicenter, episode 398, with guests Lukas Vogelsang and Cassidy Daly from Centrifuge. Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Ryan from Ukraine, and I'm here with Friederike Ernst. So today we're speaking with Lukas Vogelsang and Cassidy Daly, who are respective CEO and co-founder and leading token design and research at Centrifuge. So, but before we talk with Lucas and Cassidy about Centrifuge, we'd like to talk about our sponsors for a minute. So first of all, Exodus. Exodus is an easy to use wallet, which supports hundreds of assets and has native apps for all the platforms, including iOS and Android. It's a fully non-custodial wallet and the firm believers in the not your keys, not your coins mantra. So you can go to exodus.com and give it a try. And then secondly, Solana. So Solana is a next generation blockchain with super fast blocks, very cheap fees, and scalability is the single biggest challenge, I think, that you know we're facing crypto today. And so Solana has really optimized everything to provide the most performant blockchain. So you can go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. And that the Paraswap, Paraswap just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap and comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. Start trading at paraswap.io slash epicenter. Cool. And with that, let's get into Centrifuge. Well, let's start at the beginning. Can you share with us a bit, like, you know, how did Centrifuge come about and what's the vision for the project? So Centrifuge came about when we started looking at how we expand um, sort of this new world that we're building in crypto to businesses, to users all around the world, and how we allow them to use their existing assets that they have. Um, so we looked at how we actually allow a business to use, say, an, in, an unpaid invoice that they have or a real estate investor to use their property to get liquidity uh, from DeFi instead of banks. Um, back when we started, actually, DeFi didn't even really exist. We just said, okay, well, what if people could use crypto to pay for this? And sort of as this DeFi ecosystem developed, we sort of refined our idea and, and our mission to uh, focus really on how we tap into this liquidity, how we allow um, users to use it for stuff that exists outside of the world of truly crypto native assets. And so what, what Centrifuge does today uh, is we allow users to borrow money, usually stablecoin, you most, most often die against any kind of real world asset. We work with, um, I mentioned real estate, trade finance, to bring those assets on chain, allow investors to invest in them, earn, a, earn yield on a stable asset, um, but to do so fully in crypto. Centrifuge is uh, live on Maker as a first real world asset. So New Silver is our first asset originator that got a 5 million die uh, debt ceiling that they're using to actually mint the first die in the world that's backed by real estate. Basically bringing um, real world assets to the Web3, I can imagine there's a lot of different challenges to overcome. What were they or those to you? The challenges are are slightly different, but in a lot of ways similar to a lot of the on-chain stuff that we do. Well, the, the biggest issue for us that we started um, working on was actually how do we bring liquidity in these assets? Unlike, say, ETH or other tokens that have liquidity that are fully fungible, a lot of these assets in the real world are uh, non-fungible, right? Like your house is not the same as mine, your invoice, your credit. If you want to borrow money, that's a different credit risk than if I want to borrow money. Um, and so if you try to build a, build a marketplace where uh, investors and borrowers come together, well, it's, this is something that's easy, much easier to do if we're all borrowing and lending the same thing. And that's why you see like money markets like Aave or blending protocols like Maker that just work with fully liquid assets actually picking up and becoming sort of successful, building out their use cases much earlier than uh, lending on, on non-fungible assets. And so the, the approach we're taking there is um, we allow these real world assets to be bundled into different pools. Um, the, the word that or the, the concept that exists in the traditional world is securitization. 
meaning you take different different assets, uh, you put them into one one entity, one pool is what we call them, and then you allow investors to buy shares of that pool. Um, and so that gives you the advantage that now instead of having to find a borrower that or a lender that wants to invest in exactly that house, and then at the at the right time, the right amount. And, and on the other side, finding a borrower doing this matching, you can actually now just throw all of these assets into a pool. And as an investor, I can just say, oh, I want to invest in real estate and I can buy uh, tokens from this real estate pool. Or I want to invest in uh, trade finance. I want to invest in companies that are growing and need, need money for, their, for, oper- um, for funding their operations. So I, I put money into that pool. Right? And on the other side, there's more borrowers. And so that, that sort of solves this, this coordination challenge. So we've seen in, in DeFi that there are problems with listing things as collateral in terms of making sure that this is a trusted asset and uh, there is a good price feed for it. And uh, basically, a lot of people actually have to collude to actually make this go south. I could imagine that this is even more difficult with real world assets. I mean, basically, as you said, my house is not the same as your house and my car is not the same as your car. And even when you bundle things together... How do you protect yourselves and users against spam or fraud? So there's a few things we're we're doing. We already have implemented, and there's a few things we're we're still working on. I I love. Hopefully, we can talk a bit about both. So sort of the this the problem here is is of course like how do you know um, what exists out there in the real world? A very simple thing we do. Well, I mean it's it's actually rather complicated, but sort of the first layer of defense is. Well, we do make sure that there is legal recourse, and so in if in in case all else fails, um, obviously, if you're investing in one of these pools, you there is a legal recourse you can go and you can sue um, the person that tries to walk away with your money, and so like this is not we don't live in a completely lawless world, right? Um, and 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 so like you can rely on that as an ultimate backstop. But then, um, really, the 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 second um, level of defense maybe that that we have is I talked about, we, we bundle different assets into pools and what we give investors is we give investors the choice to invest in actually two different uh, tranches. It's a, each pool has two different tokens. Um, so where if you want high risk, high return, you can invest in what, what is typically called the junior tranche. Um, those are, uh, we call them tin tokens They have a variable return and take first losses, or you can invest in the senior tranche and that gives you a fixed return, so a fixed interest rate, um, but you're protected by the junior. And maybe to just give you a very quick example, uh, say we have we have $1 million from, uh, that investors invest, uh, $900,000 invest in the senior and $100,000 invest in the junior. You have a $1 million dollars in assets on the other side, right? Maybe that's 20 different loans. Say one of those 20 different loans worth $50,000 defaults. So you now have um, only $950,000 left. That means actually that if, if you're a senior investor, um, you're not suffering anything because you have those junior investors covering the first $100,000. On the other side, for the junior investors, they would see a 50% loss because they're losing $50,000 on the $100,000 that they invested. And so what this actually gives you It gives two different kinds of investors, two different kinds of products that they both actually like more, right? If I'm the lending protocol or I'm just like some retail investor that wants to put money into a savings bank, not thinking much about like the risk or exactly what these assets should be, then I know there's like other investors that effectively want to leverage their position. They want to have more risk exposure and make more money and they're, they're taking that risk for me. And so that structure basically gives you insurance that if there's like a single default, uh, if there's there's issue with the different assets, um, that that uh, is covered by by sort of these junior investors. And so that's that's a, a very crucial part. Um, and so, for example, Maker, um, in the example of New Silver, they are investing in the senior tokens, whereas other investors that really know the, the real estate market that like like to have these high, these higher yields are investing in in the junior. And ultimately, this is sort of where we're developing the product to. It's actually that these junior investors become more important uh, over time. And actually, maybe I want to hand over to Cassidy to talk a bit about what we have in store there. Yeah. One of the most exciting things that we have in store and are working on 
uh, we're calling the underwriter token. And really, it's actually just these 10 tokens that these more advanced either junior investors or underwriters would be able to actually give a more accurate assessment of the risk of these assets. So more accurate because it is distributed. Um, there are going to be a lot of different entities participating in this. Whereas today in traditional systems, this is generally either just a bank that you're working with or a credit agency. And the incentives there are really not aligned for either of those parties. Either you're a bank that's just trying to make the best return that you can. Um, and so they're not necessarily incentivized to price the risk as accurately to the borrower's favor. And the credit agency almost has the opposite uh, because they're just paid directly by the business in most cases. And so they're just looking to make money and are also not really aligned with the incentives of accurately pricing this risk. So the idea here with this underwriter token model is that um, by holding the TIN token, you actually have skin in the game as an underwriter or junior investor here. And that aligns the incentives a lot more closely to actually have something to lose if you were to price this risk inaccurately. I think there's still a lot of work that we have to do there um, in making that system work well, but super excited to move that forward. And I think that's one of the next big pieces that we have here in Centrifuge. Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat and they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. I can give a bit of a picture, a bit more of what the underwriters actually will do, um, because I do think they really tackle this problem that, that you mentioned, Federica, which is like, how do you price these real world assets, right? Because they exist outside of crypto. And you need to know, okay, what it is, what it is exactly. And so I, we have what we have in these pools is we have these investors that have skin in the game that take first loss. Um, and so they actually what they can do is they can they need to actually decide. They need to be able to know if this loan that we're giving here to a borrower that wants to buy a house if that loan should be priced at five percent interest per year or eight percent. So the mechanisms that we're designing now is effectively we're creating. We're, we're enabling these pools to actually have logic where different underwriters can stake um, some of their junior tokens to assets that they like, meaning assets that they think are priced correctly, are valued correctly. So in, in the example of a house, right, you have the value of the house. Is it worth $500,000 or is it worth $600,000? And should the borrower pay 5% or 8% interest? And so if a borrower comes and says they want to borrow um, money for a set house, um, these different underwriters can uh, stake towards the, the, the loan proposals that they like. So 500,000 at 8% or 400,000 at 5%. Um, the pool then will just sort of select only the assets that get the most um, endorsement by these different uh, underwriters. Thus, like you have now a, as Cassidy mentioned, in a way to decentralize this pricing challenge. So you can now build sort of a system where anyone can come in and underwrite these assets. They can pull in external data sources. They can look at historic real estate market data. They can look at credit rating information. They can uh, go and look, check out the house themselves and see if it actually exists and like talk to, talk to the, or, or look at which neighborhoods might have the most potential for development, right? So, so if you have all these different things that you can bring in and ultimately sort of these different underwriters can collaborate to then come up with the best credit rating or the best sort of 
pricing of this asset. And for us, what, what does actually the best pricing mean, right? Like we're trying to build a fairer and a more efficient financial system. And that means we're not overcharging the borrowers, but we're also not undercharging. And that means it just needs to be, the price needs to be more than the, uh, def- the risk of default, but not too much more. And that's exactly where like then these underwriters are incentivized to stake towards these assets such that, uh, such that the, p- the pool ultimately lends out uh, money at these rates. And that's sort of the idea of, of where we see actually solving this, all of these challenges with real world assets, not with just oracles and sort of trying to pull in data more, but creating actually an incentive system around that. It seems that going from, from what you just said, that if an underwriter and a borrower collude, so basically say, I, I'm, I have a house and I want to have a mortgage on it on Centrifuge, but the house is an absolute dump and basically I, sh- I really shouldn't be getting any money for it. But I have an underwriter who's willing to signal that they looked at the house and that it's fine. Um, the underwriter would never be out as much as I could potentially gain, right? So do you have some sort of reputation um, system to, to combat that? Yeah, this is, this, is, this is, I think, the one important part, what we do by bringing by bringing in underwriters that actually vote on chain, right, is that we start creating a track record of these underwriters that is verifiable on chain, right? If you're borrowing against a house here in in Germany and you're borrowing against, or you have a loan in, in the US and like different people doing this stuff, there's, it's going to be impossible to to like build up this this reputation. And so like for borrowers, this is very challenging, but with underwriters, them being on chain, they actually do have a reputation that goes beyond just a single transaction. And so you can exact, you have these, you have these uh, game theoretic issues that you mentioned, um, and you, you tackle those with reputation and you tackle them with giving exactly that transparency, right? So an underwriter that has done underwriting for months or years um, and has done that on many different assets and now effectively has a reputation, um, they will attract capital, right? Because we're now changing the dynamics of, as an investor, do I invest in real estate in the US or do I invest in real estate in Germany to actually, which pool has reputable underwriters that have a proven track record and have a significant amount of money at stake, right? And so now actually, if they start doing these kind of, if they did one of these deals where they were colluding with the borrower, then they would give up all of that, all of that reputation. Um, and would uh, would ultimately lose out. Another important part of how you can um, counteract that is, of course, you don't want to have just one underwriter in the pool. That's sort of the single point of failure that you don't want, right? The minute you have two underwriters, and generally they agree on which loans should be added, but then there's one loan that doesn't uh, that doesn't get the vote or sort of slight signal of confidence by the second underwriter. Um, that would be very detrimental, right? Like they, they would clearly signal something's wrong, and so that. This so so by actually allowing underwriters to sort of do their work independently, verifying all of this off-chain stuff themselves, uh, we we add the second protection here. Besides reputation, we also add uh, redundancy. And just to build on that, the second, third, or fourth underwriter, they're they're incentivized to check that information from that first underwriter because they would stand to lose first if those assets were to default. So having that skin in the game provides that incentive to really um, deter this sort of collusion in, in both of those ways that Lucas mentioned. And then on the flip side of it, one could actually question how do we make sure that there's enough competition as well, that they're not overcharging these borrowers as well. And I think that's where having a transparent system comes into play as well. Because you then have borrowers that are able to look at lots of different sources for financing and actually having the underwriters be able to compete on a good rate for the borrower on the one side, but also being the first to lose on the other side um, if some asset were to default. Is there a minimum value on which I can borrow on? I mean, we just talked about houses, right? So basically houses, I, I can I can see how a loan on a house um, would sustainably finance underwriters or a couple of underwriters to actually keep the system stable. But say I, I want to take out a loan on my car or say even my reputation or, you know, something else. Would that work as well? 
So, so you can take out a loan on your reputation if someone's willing to trust it, right? Um, there are, I mean, there in the real world, there are many places where where you do that. Uh, if you're building a company and you convince you convince people to give you money to build that company, sure they're investing and they're getting shares in that company, but ultimately they're trusting that you actually want to build this, and so that does happen in the real world. I think sort of that what we want to get to is a place where it's always easier to to lend money to to people to to users when there's some like data avail- available. Um, so like in the case of real estate, you can verify and check what's in the land register or like what uh, real estate platforms say that certain properties are ver- worth. Right, sort of looking at all that. I generally wouldn't say we want to limit it to anything. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to find a way that this can be done safely, and I, I do believe it can. Right, because if 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 you assume that people are generally honest and you price the dishonesty correctly, um, and then you can actually make money lending to dishonest people. This is a bit of a. I mean, not to to generally honest, but maybe some dishonest people, and that's that's the truth in in every in every asset class. I mean, even in crypto, right? Like by the point, by the time you're onboarding an ERC-20 token of a major DeFi project into another DeFi protocol, well, like there's a fair amount of trust in that the the leadership or the sort of the, the team behind that certain DeFi project is actually not just going to disappear the next day, right? And so like, I think, yeah, there's there's obviously, they will never work completely without trust. Uh, and that that I, or some some amount of honesty and some amount of good intention, but you you need to price it and you need to make sure that you protect yourself as much as possible from fraud here. And in terms of a strict minimum, the other part of your question, Federica, we don't have strictly speaking a, a minimum of of how much you you need to borrow per se. But that said, um, Tin Lake is live on Ethereum right now, and gas fees are fluctuating but sometimes too high prohibitively high for you know lower than a, a certain amount so i don't know if we've seen any fine assets finance for less than a thousand yeah at a thousand it wouldn't make sense already but yeah now let's talk about solana we all know that scalability is one of the most important issues facing the blockchain industry today The Solana blockchain has been engineered from the ground up, optimizing for performance and scalability. The network supports thousands of transactions a second with 600 millisecond block times and over 500 different validators. It's not a sharded blockchain, but a single blockchain hyper-optimized for performance. And that makes it easy to maintain composability between the apps on Solana so they work together seamlessly. The Solana ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace. And it's a great place to build your project and get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. We've talked a little bit sort of like on like what type of asset, but I would actually love if you can like zoom out a little bit here and talk a bit about, you know, like the use case and the problem, you know, how big of a problem is this like globally and like, where is the problem? Is it in particular types of assets, particular industries? Is it like geographically distributed? And like, what do you think are the the use cases where like centrifuge can make the biggest difference? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the global financial system, right, is, is, is quite the monster. And I think for a lot of, uh, I mean, at least when I entered the space, uh, that was a very big motivation was to say, okay, well, actually we can build this better. And, um, and I think, I mean, the idea of Bitcoin and then and, and also like Ethereum, and, and I think it's, that's pretty much a shared ideology. I think sort of, and this is really what excites me so much about DeFi and where I see like very much the, the idea and sort of the vision aligned is with, with what Centrifuge is doing is, well, it's like DeFi is transparent and it doesn't have any barrier of entries, right? Like the code, your code doesn't, doesn't care about where who you are or what you do. If you have one ETH, you can go to Maker and you can borrow. If you have one ETH, you can go to Aave and borrow. Like right, same rates, same terms. Every, everything is accessible. Uh, if you like, actually sort of before even DeFi came, right? Like ICOs in 2017, very much were sort of. It was the same idea. It was like you can do an IPO. You can sell your company on Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange. You can spend millions in legal fees. And go through this entire like system with a 
bunch of intermediaries all trying to extract value and like sort of bunch of regulation and mostly unnecessary paperwork to sort of get to having your company be traded and everyone being able to buy it on Robinhood. Um, and ICOs said, no, actually, all you need is you need to deploy an ERC-20 token and convince people that this is like a token that will become something cool and that people will want to buy. And and I think sort of then like continuing DeFi is so we're just like trying to build sort of apply the same idea of no barrier of entries, no transparency, like radically lower cost to like all these different financial products that exist, right? ICOs are the first ones, lending protocols, all this stuff. What Centrifuge is doing, we're trying to build the same thing. We're, we're saying, okay, well, now we have this DeFi ecosystem. How can we apply it to other assets that are not truly crypto native, to real world assets? And the but the benefits are ultimately the same, right? And so who who do these benefits who profits most from these? Actually, it's the smaller borrowers, right? If you're, uh, and this, these numbers are actually pretty mind blowing. But if uh, Google, Google last year borrowed money ten billion dollars at half a percent interest rate per year, so they issued a bond and sold it on the market. Uh, at the same time, small businesses were paying around ten to fifteen percent uh, APY on their sort of short term loans. Um, so that means that Google is paying 30% less for their capital, right? And capital is like, a, it's one of the most important ingredients to building a business. So they have like a 30x advantage here. At the same time, if you look at default rates, SMEs in the US, like they, there's like a default rate of about 2% per year. So if you look at that, you're like wondering, like, why, why is an SME paying 10 to 15% when the risk of default across the whole US is like 2%? Um, and like, why is Google paying so little? And like, where's, where's this spread going? And so like this financial system that we live in today, right. Um, is really just geared towards making it very efficient for the largest, uh, players and is, is sort of put this in place where like now banks are not really incentivized to try to lower the cost of capital, make this system cheaper to use and make it fairer to use for others. And I think that's what, what DeFi can do for a lot of our users. And so who we, who we see like using Centrifuge and, and it's super exciting to see is a lot of like what you call, what we call FinTech startups. So companies that want to build new lending products and don't want to rely on these banks that screw them over on fees are not really interested in negotiating with them until they're like themselves worth billions of dollars. And they, they look to DeFi as a, as a solution that gives them more optionality. It gives them like different sources of capital and it, it allows them to sort of get rid of uh, this whole legacy world. Yeah, no, I think that's a great, uh, a great explanation. And of course you, you mentioned as a comparison, you know, Google, and a US, uh, you know, SME that can borrow at 10 to 15 percent. But then I think in, you know, in a lot of the world, oh, it's way more. Yeah, either it's way more or even even it's just not available, right? Like you just cannot get access to credit. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's another large problem that we're trying to target is access to credit at all. And I don't think it's necessarily bad intentions by the global financial system. In a lot of cases with banks, it's more of an issue of whether this would be profitable for them or not. It's just so much legwork for them to do the KYC necessary, do the analysis necessary to give a loan to one of these SMEs, especially in different areas of the world. And I think bringing that on chain and bringing the level of transparency that we can with Web3 changes the game there. It makes it a lot more, um, there's information a lot more available that um, not only banks, but, but any investor could actually start financing these different assets um, in a way that just did, wasn't feasible before. Yeah, I mean, before before crypto, I at one point worked for about like eight months for this commodities trading company. And I think that that is sort of like uh, is rem remained very much as a use case that seems like such a good fit. And I think there's, there were several reasons for it. You know, one was just the execution of this thing of like, you know, some company buys from the other company. And then, you know, they would have some banks that would go in between and, you know, they use this archaic instrument, letter of credit and mail documents around. And it was like a horrific process. But the other thing 
that stood out to me is that you know this was a pretty big company or medium-sized to large company so they might have had like you know 500 million dollars worth of like uh, you know, goods uh, shipping around and or like invoices receivable for these commodities they would be like selling across the world. But they could only go to like their bank and they could say, look, I have this like huge pool of things and, you know, it's like $500 million worth that we will receive. So can you give working, can you like give some credit facility? And then the bank would be like, okay, this is like 500 million, you know, so we can give you like 300 million or something like that. But actually, it wasn't granular at all, right? They could only go to their bank to give, like, you know, kind of all of it. And you couldn't collateralize the individual receivable, right? Because I think that was just impossible to do from a, from a process perspective. And, you know, they wouldn't live long enough. But so I think the idea when you can actually turn each of them in, in, in an individual asset and then allow anybody to go in and finance it, it's just like, a, uh, it's extremely powerful. Yeah, I mean, this is where like, I think right, when we talk about a bank underwriting the risk of like an individual asset like that, like, like if you don't fall into one of their like 100 product lines, like you're, you're an individual wanting to buy a house and you're getting a, a, a mortgage, you're like one of their large corporate clients and you have an existing relationship and they're just going to put you into this risk bucket here, right? Like this is how like a bank will work. And so the same way, like Google can go and say, we're doing a $10 billion secure, um, bond issuance and we'll get the money on the market and people will be bidding for it. But if I'm the, if I have this like one invoice that is giving me even a hundred million dollars in like, uh, money in the next couple of months right and it's relatively small for the financial system that sort of that we know of today people miss out or sort of are, don't fit into one of these buckets all the time and the system today is not really operating at that scale and i believe that DeFi and sort of getting sort of de defining all of this in code building the the underwriter system right where like now an underwriter can actually come and look at your hundred million dollar invoice and for them maybe because they are very tech savvy and they're very efficient. They use data sources that like maybe banks will never use. So they have this, they, they've had this system in place, like they can be made more aggressive at underwriting assets that maybe a bank would never do. And this will then open up, give these assets liquidity, which they wouldn't have seen before. And giving these assets liquidity means now they're, they're able to tap into similar pools of liquidity with similar cost of capital that like some of these very large uh, businesses can tap into today. And that, that is then what is truly changing the system we have today where Google pays 50 basis points and, uh, and this SME pays 10, 20% to like this difference being, being much, much um, smaller and ideally really just the, the closer, the, the risk of default, right? Instead of the paying for this rat tail of, of processes that your legacy financial institution has. When you want to trade tokens on Ethereum, make sure to consider Paraswap. Paraswap is a decentralized exchange aggregator so that you can get the best price across multiple Ethereum DEXs. And now Paraswap has just been integrated in Ledger Life. This means you can swap tokens using your ledger directly from the Ledger Life app. No third parties involved. Paraswap is also multi-chain and available on Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. Give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. We'd like to thank Paraswap for their support of Epicenter. I think I somewhat understand the borrower segment now. So let's talk about the lender segment. So who do you expect to lend to these institutions? I heard the word investor many times now. I even heard securitization. Is there a regulatory barrier here? Because it seems like this should be caught under SEC laws. Yeah, so these assets are clearly securities and we've always we've always operated under that assumption and made sure that sort of each pool is issuing a, a regulated security. This is done with the legal framework that we have that is based out of the US. So you go through KYC, you go, you sort of make sure that you follow your, uh, you pass anti-money laundering laws and then you can get approved to, rate, to invest in these pools and then um, participate by, by supplying DAI to the contract. But there is, there is mandatory KYC, which is um, unfortunately unavoidable um, until we can uh, start lobbying the, 
the uh, the global financial system to maybe um, become a bit more sane about KYC laws. That's that's really out of our control. But yeah, so so there is there is a bit of a barrier of entry. I think ultimately this is not really making crypto um, making or breaking for crypto. I fundamentally believe that. I mean, if if crypto really the only, if the only advantage was that you didn't have to do KYC, then I think it would be a very very bad uh, USP for crypto because there's really so much other cool stuff and so many other benefits that I think totally make worth it. Right outside of that, so yeah, we have basically a KYC framework. You go through go through that. Once you pass it, then you're really free to operate in in that as you wish. You can supply liquidity. You can remove liquidity. And and then also sort of one one thing we are doing, and this is a bit where uh, now it gets unfortunately really complicated. Um, but of course, like our goal is that investors are not just individuals like you and me, but well, we also want to bring this at these assets to other DeFi protocols because these other DeFi protocols are very much unknown to the law um, t- as of today. There's obviously uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done to make sure we find a legally compatible setup so far we've done that with maker uh, where we actually are now onboarded and in the coming weeks we should have four more going for more assets going live there we are just announced um sort of to the or we've just published a ave request for comments in the ave community to launch a money market where investors can um, supply liquidity to real world assets and borrowers so these different pools can then borrow depending on where there's needs so instead of having to pick whether you want to invest in real estate or in invoices and you need to manage the liquidity in one pool and another, like the Aave market will basically just give you will, if by supplying liquidity to that, you will give it to whoever has, has liquidity, needs liquidity right now. And sort of this, the, the benefits that the, the Aave money market uh, concept gives you. Right. Um, so, so those are the next steps. And so we're sort of on this mission of like, making working out these compatible legal frameworks like make working out the technology to go and sort of extend DeFi with these real world assets can you explain a little bit of like how does this work under the hood like what are the processes that an asset goes through and the steps that somebody has to take to issue and borrow against such an asset using centrifuge the simplest description of what what each pool is, it's like an on-chain credit fund, right? Um, so you have assets on one side, you have investors on another side. And what we do is we actually ta- we couple a legal structure to these smart contracts. So we deploy the you deploy a pool. Um, along that, you actually create a legal SPV, special purpose vehicle. So that's a, a company, a Delaware company, um, that then effectively signs the paperwork with all these different borrowers and gets the legal recourse against these different assets and investors that invest in this pool basically sign some general terms, a subscription document. That means that when they supply DAI uh, to that pool, they get certain rights, right? The, the rights to receive the payments from, from those uh, real world assets. And so that's the basic legal setup that has to happen, both technical and legal setup. And then sort of Based on that, the asset originator does a lot of work of explaining the kind of assets they want to originate and how they want to structure the pool. So in case of New Silver, New Silver talks about uh, how they make sure that all the borrowers that they want to work with, that they are actually going to repay, what the credit risk is that they're going to take on, what the interest rate is, how much uh, the junior token holders, so what this this buffer is, is it 10%, is it 20%, and then sort of once that step is done, then um, investors can come in and start supplying liquidity to the pool. And so as the liquidity basically as this goes into the reserve in the pool, that money is then made available for the asset originator to borrow. And so then they can start issuing loans to different people that have that, that want to borrow for, in New Silver's case uh, to buy to buy a house, renovate a house. And so um, then what the asset originator does is they take this they take the die that they can borrow from that pool, turn it into dollars and wire that to the person that in many cases, actually, they don't even know about the fact that their that their loan is financed by crypto or that there's like some maker vault uh, minting die to actually generate the money that is used to pay for that loan. But so they they're sort of completely abstract that they're like the, the very sophisticated wallet or like an, an on a fiat on off ramp, right, for these borrowers. On the other side, investors 
they they can then just as they like either like supply or redeem so put more money into the pool or take money out and sort of the smart contracts and manage all these payments from borrowers to investors both interest and principal sort of making sure that that uh, everyone um, gets the the share of the, the interest return and and so on well, let's talk a little bit about, so Centrifuge has also a token, right? A CFG token. So what's the function of the, I mean, you know, besides we talked about drop and tin tokens, which is different tranches, but then there's also a Centrifuge, another token called CFG. Can you explain like how does this token work and how does it relate to, uh, you know, this process? Yeah, so we have Centrifuge token CFG that is the token that powers Centrifuge Chain. So Centrifuge Chain is the special purpose chain that we built using Substrate. Um, and that's really specialized to this Centrifuge specific use case. So the Centrifuge token is used there for paying for transaction fees. So sort of like gas on Ethereum. It's also used for the chain security. So right now that's uh, staking by validators and nominators, as well as as a governance token. So CFG is used to vote on things from runtime upgrades to uh, probably eventually a lot more features upcoming in the future. Cool. I guess you just mentioned uh, also the the polka dot, the, the substrate chain. Actually, I should also mention, I forgot to mention this in the beginning, but that like uh, you know, of course, one the company I co-founded. So we've also been running a validator on on that chain, and I've also sort of participated in some of these early tin lake pools and like invested in in the project as well. So I mentioned that. But so, can you talk about because right now, right, we talked about Maker, and you know, there's things that are happening on Ethereum where you can take some of those assets, but then there's also this independent, at the moment, sovereign substrate chain. So like, you know, how do those interact and how is that going to change uh, in the future? So right now, this Tin Lake depth that we've been talking about is live on Ethereum. That's been great and also given us access to the DeFi ecosystem that's grown there. But gas fees are quite prohibitive. Um, and so the plan with Centrifuge Chain is to be able to move Tin Lake onto Centrifuge Chain from Ethereum. Um, to make it a lot faster, cheaper, um, and just generally make the DAP more accessible for even now potentially even lower uh, values of loans, as we talked about earlier. So the first major use case there is, is really powering the Tin Lake DAP for Centrifuge Chain. Going forward, adding this functionality will also be easier now that we have this chain that we can really specifically cater to this use case. Um, so we don't have to wait for ETH 2.0, um, which we're still excited about, but it, it makes it us a lot more nimble in terms of dealing with the different um, use cases that come up for us that might not matter as much to the Ethereum community, for example. And so as, as you mentioned, you know, we're built on Substrate and that connects us to the Polkadot ecosystem. And so we'll be launching Centrifuge Chain as a pair chain on Polkadot. And as sort of a precursor to that, basically a live test um, ahead of launching Centrifuge Chain as a pair chain, uh, we'll be launching a different network, a different chain called Altair on Kusama. And that's really, for us, the most important thing there is, is having this sort of test bed um, with live value. So we're launching Altair as a parachain first, which um, since Centrifuge Chain has been live for one year, it's, um, we see it as pretty important to test that um, and make sure that everything goes well with Altair first before we do this launch for Centrifuge Chain. Um, and then with that next step of moving Tinlake onto Centrifuge Chain, that would go onto Altair first. And... If any kinks were to come up, iron those out on Altair before we move that over to Centrifuge Chain. Um, so I think it's going to become a really important part of this sort of testing process for us. I assume you've also looked at Ethereum Layer 2s and in the end then uh, opted for Polkadot slash Substrate. What was the decision process behind that? So actually, when we started uh, Centrifuge Chain, there were no Layer 2s that were accessible. 
Um, so we were already starting to build centrifuge chain at the end of 2019. Um, and so at that time, really the only viable alternative was to build either using substrate. Um, the Cosmos SDK was something that was available, but not quite as accessible for us to really start moving forward on at the time. So it was actually really just that we needed to move ahead. We didn't want to wait for anything else to become available. And so we went ahead and built Centrifuge Chain. Now that Layer 2s are accessible on Ethereum, I mean, that's, that's great for other DeFi projects. Um, I'm excited to see how those develop. But I think at the moment, this is um, going to be a really great way for us to, to scale faster. Are there problems with being on another blockchain entirety? So basically, um, you've got, you know, integrations to make a, and most of the DeFi ecosystem is on Ethereum. Does it pose problems to you? One of the things that we've had to think about that I would say was a complexity, maybe not necessarily a problem, is building this bridge. So right now we do have part of the Tin Lake Dapp that lives on Centrifuge Chain. So those are the anchors for these assets. And then that is using our um, chain bridge, centrifuge chain to Ethereum bridge to mint NFTs on Ethereum and then finance those with the Tin Lake Dapp. So that bridge was definitely a complexity that we've had to worry about. And part of launching centrifuge chain as a parachain on Polkadot will be to access the bridge that other teams are working on there and sort of outsource that work um, so that our team doesn't have to worry about those specific functionalities, and instead we can focus on our specific use case. Taking a bit of the like longer view, I I believe like DeFi definitely um, started in Ethereum. I think at at this point, I would say we're not gonna the world is not gonna be exclusively on Ethereum anymore. And so, sort of for us um as any defi project i think it would be in, not in your interest to sort of focus on on one ecosystem and you already see like so many bridges coming up between different ecosystems where um you ultimately just want to make sure that you go where the liquidity is right and and um unfortunately like finance was seeing a lot of intention i don't think that's going to uh sustain um but but i think other protocols other layer ones will build, will bring interesting concepts and ideas that um, I think sort of similarly to how on Ethereum, there was this insane, I mean, DeFi became really what it was be, through the interoperability, right? Like any ERC-20 token worked with any other, and that meant you could use Aave, Aave deposits as collateral in another lending protocol, and you could vice versa. I mean, everything worked together extremely well, right? And I think in the same way, like crypto and blockchains are going to succeed by focusing on exactly that, making sure liquidity moves where it needs to and it is available wherever uh, necessary. And for centrifuge, that means um, the asset originators and underwriters sort of create these pools on centrifuge chain, but then the investors, right, the investors, they are really just wherever they want to be. And if that's, and if there's a need for collateral in Maker on Ethereum, then it can be bridged to Ethereum. If it's if it's a, a money market on Solana, it can be on Solana or it can move to another parachain on Polkadot. And so sort of from, from, that, from that view for us, um, I believe Polkadot or Substrate was like a very um, good technical solution at the time we started. And I, I, I still see, I still believe, and I'm mean, extremely exciting now, sort of the, the point the ecosystem is at. Um, we're, we're just about to find out like, what what the uh, parachains are going to look like in, in production in the coming weeks. One of the interesting things has been to see in, in the Polkadot ecosystem is that Kusama seems to have taken on like a much more significant role over time than maybe initially was envisioned. And now you are also starting this Altair, so this other kind of centrifuge-like chain on Kusama. So I'm curious, like, how, how how is that going to work? And how do you think the, the Centrifuge parachain and the Kusama parachain are going to play together? It's been super interesting to see how much excitement has built around Kusama as a project. And like you said, I, I don't think the Polkadot team necessarily foresaw that coming. 
but it's it's posed a really great opportunity for a lot of projects to get excitement around their precursors to what they would launch on Polkadot. So I, I do think at least m- most of the projects that I've spoken to do see Kusama as the more experimental sort of test bed where things can go wrong. They can push the limits really of what's possible before it goes live on their Polkadot pair chains. And so that's exactly what we see Altera as, is really a place for experimentation, pushing the boundaries of, of what sort of things are possible. So to draw back to something that, that we talked about earlier today, um, financing, for example, your reputation. That's something that's maybe pushing the limit a little bit of what's possible today in asset financing. And so that's something that I would see as a use case that would go live on Altair first and really test it out, see what happens before it moves over to Centrifuge Chain. Um, So I think for me, it's really exciting to use Altair as that sort of test bed and try things out that maybe we wouldn't otherwise be able to on Centrifuge Chain. Super interesting. I have a question around the economic guarantees of having a governance token and basically the market cap of that governance token and the values that it ultimately controls. What are your thoughts as to this? I mean, I think it's super, super difficult to estimate any sort of market cap for a governance only token. And I've seen a lot of VCs and projects out there trying to do this. Um, usually they try to back into it based on some other sort of understanding of the token, like another use case that it has, or or how this has worked for other projects, and then just using that as a comparison, which is really inaccurate. Um, so I think it does add value, that's for sure. What sort of value it adds, I think, is heavily dependent on how it's used for the project specifically. So if that governance token is instrumental to upgrades for that product, it's going to be a lot more valuable of a governance token that's something that's really just voting on minor things like members of the council um, or transaction fees that of a product that barely gets any use at all. So I think there are a lot of differences there that, that can be looked at and, and compared, but in terms of a quantitative assessment, I think that's still super difficult to determine right now. But that said, I would say we've definitely looked at valuation models for the centrifuge token, not looking at the governance aspect of it. So really just looking at the transaction fees on centrifuge chain and modeling what those could look like over time and really giving this token a use case in addition to that. So adding future functionality that I won't mention today, just so that we don't get ourselves in a hot place, but... Um, it's definitely something that we're thinking about, that this token needs to have future use cases, future utilities, and um, certainly not just governance, I would think. The most common way that governance tokens on Ethereum in DeFi seem to have kind of gone towards uh, having value, right, would be that there's some sort of I guess in this case, right, there could be like some kind of small percentage of the interest going not to the investors, but to some sort of like, you know, CFG holders in the, you know, I think we see that with something like urine finance or like, so is is that something that's also like possible or do you think that would be desirable at all? I don't think it makes sense to have something akin to what I would call a dividend for stocks. Um, for token holders. So for example, having a a percentage of the token supply go to token holders just for the fact that they hold the token, to me, doesn't make sense because this really should be an incentive for providing value. And if just holding the token is providing value, well, I think, I mean, I don't think that actually makes sense. Maybe someone disagrees, but I really think that incentives should be built in that are rewarding actual active participation in the protocol. So whether that is being a council member and participating in governance in a very active way or running a validator node or providing underwriter services for Art and Lake Pool as an example, these are things that are active participation in the protocol that I think um, should be incentivized for the health of the entire system. Um, But just holding the token in and of itself, I don't think that deserves any sort of incentivization 
That said, one thing that a lot of projects are doing that sort of mimics this, um, but in a, in a different way, is a burn rate for the token. So transaction fees that are collected on chain, a certain percentage of those being burned. That is, in effect, on, on the opposite side of it, sort of like giving out tokens to every single token holder, because the value of their tokens is going up effectively if you're burning up a percentage of the token supply every year. So I think for me, that's a much better way of sort of addressing not just the token holders and their individual value, but the value of the entire system. Um, and I think to me, that's more fair than just giving out a sort of blanket dividend to every single holder. I mean, this is, this is, we're getting into rent seeking, right? I mean, there's maybe some of it is justified to like basically pay off reward early backers. And that's, I mean, that's the idea of like, like how, how investors buy tokens and then you want some value accrual in it. But yeah, generally I would, I would agree with what you, what you said, Cassidy. I think when, when looking at a value of a, a specific token and how that's going to change over time, one should really be looking at the value that the protocol is providing. And if that token has real utility that it's being used for in that protocol, then it will take on the value that the protocol is providing. So I think it's, it's really about the use case of the token and how much it's really being utilized to perform the functionality that is of value to the users. Um, so if it's really capturing that, then it will capture the value of, of that utility. And so that should really be what investors look at when they're looking at holding a token is what is the growth of this protocol going to be? Is it going to provide real value? And is the token going to capture that value? rather than looking to some sort of blanket dividend just for, for holding the token. Yeah, I see that. That makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, we're, we're a bit strapped for time, but um, I, I would like to zoom out again a little bit. So if you look at Centrifuge as a whole, what it allows you to do is it allows you to sell debt or package and sell debt. And basically, if you frame it like that, it sounds a lot like, one of you know what 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 one of the contributors to the 2008 financial crisis was namely that debt is being pack, packaged in less than transparent ways and uh, people buy it without necessarily doing the due diligence um, they should have so how do we avoid replicating you know crises we've gone through on defi and where do you see centrifuge in the very long term so like say in 10 years? I think, I mean, one of the, one of the goals with giving underwriters an economic incentive, right, is exactly addressing that standard and poor and Moody's, they majorly screwed up in, in, in the 2008 crisis and uh, walked away, not unscathed, but, but they're still around, right? Um, and they didn't have really, they, did, they had their reputation a bit at stake, but they had nothing really monetarily at stake. Um, and, and everyone, and this whole like financial system they've been in, like rating agencies got paid to give ratings and they just, they stamped the, their ratings on whatever they could as fast as possible. And that combined with like no transparency at all, right, is what, what I think very much led, led to the situation that we found ourselves in. And so like thinking about how we're approaching this, we, we have to be cognizant of this issue and make sure that we don't, don't design something accidentally that will end, will sort of end in this, in this behavior. I think this is where, where crypto and sort of open blockchains are exactly a, a huge positive, a, a huge opportunity because it, one of the core ideas of Centrifuge is to give that transparency, right. And have exactly those underwriters be, competing for the best the best way to underwrite and sort of make make money on that instead of just um sort of having this system of like established players just sort of uh work on work however they like and um that is sort of how we hope hope to address this and i think that's that's sort of in general what what DeFi is trying to do right that was the thing that stood out to me a lot also when it came to this mortgage-backed securities right that you know, you'd have people buy this pool of assets without having visibility of like what are actually the components and where did they come from. And I think having that stuff all on chain seems like a huge opportunity to have 
much more efficiency and transparency and like better risk management. Maybe before we wrap up, uh, so we've talked about a bunch of stuff, you know, so the parachain launch and the Altair, but can you tell us a little bit, like, you know, what does the roadmap look like in the next, I don't know, like year, two years, and like, what can people expect when? Yeah, so the roadmap in the next two years, I've, I've hinted at a few things. Um, we're live on Maker with the first asset class, but we want to bring many, many more. And we believe that, I mean, DeFi as a whole is going to, it has this huge opportunity to scale with real world assets, right? Like real world assets are hundreds or thousands of times bigger than crypto is today. Like where crypto is trillion, a trillion, but like that's, that's nothing compared to, to our, to the real economy. So we want to bring these, as many of these assets into DeFi and start um, sort of scaling TVL, right? And that's going to be on Maker, on Aave, on every other lending protocol um, that is interested in sort of expanding their their use case there. The second um, priority for us is um, really building this purpose-built chain of, and well, building out the, the Tinlake functionality to sort of be, make Tinlake truly multi-chain, meaning underwriters and asset originators sort of use the chain to then channel the liquidity to wherever it's needed and really building out the underwriting system because that um, is where uh, we can go and really attack the cost of capital that is like very high and very unfair towards the smaller businesses and where we can actually create create these incentives to to address that, to bring it down programmatically. And uh, that's, that's hopefully what we'll spend uh, the coming months um, months on. Super interesting. So before we uh, close, where can people find out more about Centrifuge and Tin Lake? Um, what kind of resources do you have available for them? So you can go to centrifuge.io, but really the most interesting part, I think, to start with is tinlake.centrifuge.io, which is a DAP. You can look at all of the pools, the different loans they have. You can see sort of what's happening there. Uh, we have documentation that you can read through um, as well as like a discourse uh, uh, server that you can join and well telegram twitter um, centrifuge uh, on twitter uh, that's what i would where i would go you'll see some of us speaking at uh, ecc in a couple of weeks and uh, yeah just reach out if you have any questions super cool thank you for coming on thank you both for having us thanks for having us Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.